This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to this week's episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's show, Vince McMahon has a response to the new Netflix documentary, a new Bloodline member in NXT. AEW pay-per-views may have a new home, and this might be a little bit more financially sound for you. This AEW wrestler is sticking around, but for how long? And speaking of that documentary that we previewed earlier, We are going to actually break it down. The Doc has watched all of it. The Doc has a ton of feedback on it. And uh, I think, Doc, that might be where we start the show. I'd like to welcome you in. And I I just kind of want to go right there. Let's just head right to it. The new Netflix documentary on Vince McMahon was released on Wednesday. You were able to take in all six parts. What was your big conclusion coming away from it? And what did you think of the documentary? And if you want to talk about individual episodes, feel free. Yeah, no doubt, cuz. Thank you so much. Look forward to always talking wrestling with you. It's a good time in the world of professional wrestling. It just seems like the end of the year is really kicking up with storylines across multiple companies. So, yeah, my schedule really was was so unusual. Lined up perfectly where Wednesday ended up being really an off day because the Lions have a Monday night football game. So it shifted the schedule off one one whole day so wednesday i have the whole day free outside of recording with my guy for a podcast and so i said okay i'm gonna take in the vince mcmahon documentary i'm gonna learn does he get asked about janelle grant does he get asked about what has been happening why did he get pushed out of the company does he have a power feud with triple h his daughter his son some interesting type revelations and then you start getting into it and you recognize okay who's affiliated with this it's Bill Simmons and his production company. Bill Simmons is a wrestling super fan. So I guess the best way to describe it is if you're a mark, if you watch professional wrestling, the first four episodes are nothing really new other than a historical perspective of the building of WWE, the feud with the Monday Night War. It's basically a recap of everything that you would typically already know with some additional insights from Vince McMahon. Up until you get to episode five is when you kind of get into the personality structure of Vince McMahon, the psychological dynamics. So really, if you're a a smart mark, you don't need to watch the first four episodes. Episodes five and six get into it. And it's unfortunate because right when you get into the documentary, it comes out with the caveat, the, the bullet point, that once the allegation started to hit with Ms. Grant, Vince McMahon canceled the final interview. So it was just like you're let down because you're not going to get the stuff that maybe you would have wanted to. So you don't have to see this. You will not miss anything. And I can see where, and we'll talk about it, where Vince would be upset because you learn over time that documentarians can take portions of interviews and put them at different spots to suit their needs. The start of episode six is a little bit weird because Vince makes a comment. He's like, yeah, I got three thoughts in my head right now. And one of them is about having wild sex. And it just he just says it. So you, you kind of feel like there was maybe a, a, a context in terms of how that question maybe was asked or where that kind of fit in because it's just there. And then you can you can understand. But really, the big thing, the big thesis, if you want a spoiler, you can tell. Vince McMahon is a messed up human being psychologically because of how his dad treated him and then how his stepdad treated him in childhood. And then potentially the relationship that he had with his mother was really kind of gross in some kind of way. And so his relationship with sexuality, power structure, ego is all warped. And sometimes that's how you create a, a super genius that's just focused on one thing. So it's it's sad because you you see the struggles that Shane McMahon had, that literally Shane McMahon was willing to risk his body so that his dad would just show him love because Vince never got the love as an adult. But you recognize that, look, Vince McMahon a, is a unique psychological figure, unique business person, unique individual in and of itself in terms of what he created. But it's clear now, Kenny said it, everybody said it, 
when you look behind the curtain, whatever's proven, not proven, there's some things that he did that you can probably say were way, way out of line in regards to dealing with people, dealing with uh, females, dealing with um, the way in which really I think the thing that kind of stuck out the most is that if he had some fucked up idea that he wanted to carry out in real life, he just put it in a storyline. And you start to think for a second, wait a minute, he really probably wanted to have sex with Sable, but he couldn't because he was married. So he just said, you know what, I can use my power and just create storylines. And it's narcissism at, at its highest. It's, it's weird to look at from that perspective. But this documentary, you just basically, if you have time to watch it over parts, if you want to get to the gist of it right away, five and six are perfect. If you want to enjoy the whole thing over time, you're not missing much by watching it. I graded a B minus C plus. It's it's just sad because it's 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 hyped up and sometimes you don't want to feel bad for knowing too much, but you're like, God dang it, I've already seen Vince McMahon Dark Side of the Ring. I've already seen Vince McMahon documentaries. I've already seen fifty wrestlers talk about Vince McMahon. Now to see him at this point, I just would like now, clearly, my insatiable appetite for documentaries. I love documentaries. I love six, seven part things that tell stories. The next thing needs to be Shane McMahon, Triple H, that whole dynamic of when Triple H ended up leaving wrestling to become management, how that played out with Shane McMahon, because it, uh, it's, it's a unique story to tell. And there's still a story to tell regarding the dynamics behind WWE, behind the scenes. But unfortunately, you recognize too, you know, on a lighter note, if you looking for somebody to support, everybody needs a Bruce Pritchard to kiss their ass and lick their balls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's because uh, the whole thing comes out and Bruce Pritchard's like, I don't like this, this documentary. It paints him in a bad light. Not really. It just highlights. How did it paint him in a bad light? It just, it just said he's been accused of this. And then you, you see it. And I do, I do think the fact checking was kind of funny in real time. But in the end, the, 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 the wrestling thesis is Vince McMahon did not care about what anybody in the entire universe thought about an idea. He had a vision, and if he believed it, he went for it, he pushed it, he put his life into something, and that's kind of how you got to be if you're going to be the greats of the great to build a billion-dollar company. you got to be maniacal. There's some crazy behind it, but I'm kind of glad it is where it is at this point because Triple H and a, a company that can take it global are going to manage it nicely, and the sins of the past – you hope are being corrected in the present. Yeah, I think the the big thing that I've taken out of this, and I've only seen excerpts. I haven't seen, I haven't had a chance to sit down and watch all six parts yet. The big thing I took out of it was I already knew about Vince McMahon's upbringing. I knew about what happened with him and his mom, him and his stepdad, then him and his father. I understood all that. And I understood that that was kind of the the framework for why he is the way he is. But you always knew that there was something just not right with his relationship with Shane. And I think that was probably the saddest thing to come out of, out of this documentary. Yeah. Was, there, there, there was a point where Shane had an idea and Vince just shit all over the idea and told him, he gave him a knife and was like, if you want that idea, you got to stab me. You got to kill me for it. And basically called him out and kind of tested his manhood and was like, if you're not willing to kill me for it, then it's not worth doing. And that's just, to me, that's just crazy. Like, your dad is just a nutcase if, if that's kind of how things are going. And, and Shane just kind of growing up in that which just had to be like, what the fuck? Like, what? But, yeah, it, the I guess, like, there was a moment where Shane kind of said where he came back. I don't remember which WrestleMania it was, but Vince hugged him, and he was like, that was like the first time he actually hugged me. Like, that's bonkers, man. To grow up that way and to, to only want your father's approval but never, ever be able to get it because you're – Dad is just absolutely batshit crazy like Vince is, is, is nuts. I, I look, because because I, because I want to say this, though. In regards to if you remove the dynamic of father-son, Vince is actually right in regards to, look, son, if you want to overtake me, you got to be better than me because I'm sitting here working 23 and a half hours on this project, and I know more than you. I put in more than you. If you and that's why I think Vince had so much respect for Cody because Cody left the nest, made himself special, made himself – a bigger person showed some balls. I think Vince wanted Shane to go, you know what? Fuck you, dad. And actually hit him there, leave, start a company so that Vince can compete with them. I think that that's what Vince wanted was not, don't ride the coattails of me. Go out there and do better than me. You see what I've done. You have my genes. Go out there, create something 
and go be about it. If you want an idea and you want to, Vince is the boss. Like you're not going to override a guy with 50 years experience in the ring and create it. It's his baby. He loves it to the point where that is his life. It's like Vince wrestling. And that's sad because I think life should be about more than just a regular thing. But if you want to make something supremely great, I think you got to kind of have that maniacal 23 and a half hour out of 24 day thought process about it. And so for Shane McMahon, I just think that you recognize, you know what, do I really want to grind like that? Do I really want to put in my life, miss my kids, do this to, to compete with my dad who has a 5,000 yard head start? I think Vince internally would have loved to have seen it, but I think it, it, it resolved itself when Vince recognized psychologically, wow, my son does have the respect for me. Look what he did knowing that I love this, knowing that I am embracing this world. Shane actually showed me that he would understand what I'm about and go out there and perform for the audience. He, Shane bowed down and said, hey, dad, this is what you love. OK, I'll go out there and and kill myself for your affection. And I think that's where that scene is just so crazy. It's crazy, but it's powerful, too, because you can see that Vince saw in his son what he probably wanted was, hey, you know, everybody wants a similar situation where you want your kid to kind of just be right there with you and as crazy as you. But it doesn't work like that when you come from means. It just you are not going to be as driven as Vince was to compete. So it's cra- it's crazy. It's literally crazy. But I'm kind of glad Shane is maybe not doing it then. But you never know because you're starting to see photos. He might be interested in doing yeah. it now with with, with his brother-in-law. Y- you never know. And, and what you're touching on is there was a photo of, Shane McMahon and the Young Bucks in an airport. Uh, they apparently had the same flight. They both sat in first class. Uh, they sat a row apart from each other, uh, but really didn't speak on the flight. So just to give a little context to what's going on, mm. they did kind of hold up and wait, and there was a, a, a photo taken of them, and I think it was more done to troll uh, the yeah. masses than to really do anything else. But, look, Shane McMahon has been talked about with AEW, so it's – it's out there. There are things. There, there's also that photo from a little bit ago where Shane and uh, Tony Khan had a photo together. And then remember, Shane and Mercedes Monet met in an airport and had a conversation. So there are things that could be afoot, but not right now. We don't know anything yet. So uh, there are a lot of, we'll deem them coincidences. And if you uh, are me, you don't believe that anything is ever a coincidence. So uh, things could be getting worked out. Either way, from your review, it sounds like you should go check this documentary out. You don't necessarily have to see the beginning part of it, the first couple episodes, but definitely episodes five and six are very good and add to some of the knowledge that you may already have. Um, it does sound like Janelle Grant was reached out for uh, for this documentary. She turned it down. Um, her attorneys basically said that she wants to have her day in court to tell her story, not be a part of Vince's story. Uh, so there was a little bit of creative wordplay there with them. Uh, but I plan on checking this out. This looks great. Uh, multiple people that I know have seen this, and they've all said it, it's it's worthy of the watch. So we'll be checking it out. Recommend that you check it out as well. Uh, Monday night, we checked out Monday Night Raw. And one of the big things that stuck out to me is – Kofi's going to follow Xavier's lead, and it looks like Xavier's going to be a little bit more edgy and a little bit more serious and wants to bring that to New Day. I wanted to get your perspective. Do you like a more intense New Day? We talked about this a little bit last week with New Day possibly going heel and, and just kind of really working away from the fun baby face nature of their of their characters. And right now, I don't know if this is going to fracture Kofi and Kingston. I'm not sure if we're going to get the split. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. We might just get a more ramped up, a more serious, a more in-your-face, more intense New Day. And do you want to see that? Yeah, it's an evolvement of their characters. I do think that, you know, with heels, you can then kind of go into a bunch more situations with tag teams, maybe over on SmackDown. But, uh, look, you can't have the same character over time. You have to evolve, and I think it's going to open up doors for the new day in regards to wreaking havoc. And look, they've had their they've had their babyface run, and I think a new a new fresh avenue of portraying these guys. I don't think there's going to be anything wrong with that. Yeah, I think this could be a, a just a really nice way to kind of create another side of these guys, right? Like I'm liking what I'm seeing out of Xavier. I think Kofi's a little 
foot in the mud right now because he's like, wait, 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 what are we doing? Wait, hold on, who, what? Holding on to the past where Xavier's like, no, this is what we need to do to take this thing above and beyond. We need to take this higher. We need to become new. We've got to evolve ourselves. So I'm liking what I'm seeing. Uh, I think I think it's interesting. I think it's it's a good way to really flesh out some more dimensions to these characters and specifically to the New Day. If Big E ever is able to come back, could you see Big E being that big brawny heater for these guys, that guy who's able to just run through people and beat them up and them having a bit of a nasty streak? I think it would be incredibly interesting. While Xavier's a little bit more cerebral with it, and and Kofi's kind of the the acrobatic guy who can do just about everything, so I, I think it's interesting, and I think this is uh, a, a nice new addition to to their characters and into the new day. So we'll see what happens. I'm I'm kind of waiting around, just watching, just wondering what that next step's going to be for these guys. We know Xavier's going to take on Rey Mysterio. Could be a really good match. We'll see what happens. Should be should be a lot of fun. I think the other big thing that came out of Monday night was Jay Uso is your new Intercontinental Champ, and I wanted to get your thoughts on on this decision because look, you had Braun Breaker just became the Intercontinental Champ. Jay Uso always seemed like he was kind of the upper card jobber, right? For lack of a better term, his singles career he'd always get put in these matches, and he was supposed to help highlight the guy that was across from him. Never really won. You never really took it serious. Uh, Braun Breaker's supposed to be the new big guy. Braun Breaker's supposed to get a good push. Braun Breaker is supposed to be the future of what they want to do. We talked about that here on this podcast, talking about when Netflix, when Netflix rolls around with Monday Night Raw, it's going to be centered a lot around Braun Breaker. And Breaker just got that title. I don't think I was like watching that. I didn't expect Jay Uso to win. I thought this was going to be a hell of a match, and I thought Braun Breaker was going to come out with with the dub. Instead, Jay Uso is now your new Intercontinental Champ, and I, lo- me myself, I love the decision because it adds a little bit of unpredictability to the booking. A lot of times, booking gets stale, especially when you start kind of thinking about things and working through stuff in your head rationally. Like, okay, well, Braun Breaker just got the belt; he's not going to lose it. Uh, does Jay Uso really need this right now? He's super over. Like, I don't know. If you heard, when that crowd hit, when his music hit, like you felt it in your chest through the TV screen. That crowd was so into him. So dude is super over. Does he need to win the belt? No. Does Braun Breaker? Probably, you probably need to keep building on that. Instead, they've kind of pulled the carpet right out from underneath you, and instead, Jey Uso's your new champ. What did you make of, of the decision to go in that direction and kind of pull a 180 from what we're used to as far as booking goes? Yeah, it's great because it has the feel of, look, and, and I know, you know, we're not comparing Jey Uso to this character, but it kind of has the feel of like what happened with Bret Hart. So synonymous with the Hart Foundation, then you shine the light on Bret Hart and you realize, whoa, there's something there as a character. And then he works his way up, wins the Intercontinental title, then ends up became, becoming a world champion and a face of the company. Jay's got a long way to go to, to take that next step up the climb, but look, Rikishi was saying, man, what's going on with Jey Uso? It's been damn near 14 years and three years of work as a singles performer. And look, the reason why people loved it, because it was a slow build. It was a slow payoff. He was a tag team superstar, synonymous with the Usos, then is in one of the premier angles in the history of the company. And the bloodline elevated his profile, and then they said, okay, and then you also got to realize he had personal troubles with his family. You know, there were times where there were things going on with him and his brother that were outside of the ring that just weren't the best for business. And so you got to build up that trust with the company. And then with everything going on, you realize, OK, let's go. Let's set forth the path of building the Jey Uso singles character. And it, they just didn't rush it. And sometimes there are people like Braun Breaker who have the history and, and all that that just get shot to the moon and things like that. But there's also the slow build of a former tag person, a uh, person involved in the tag team scene. And now they're given that singles opportunity. And you realize, man, this is a nice build. He's built himself up. He got himself over. He got a crowd entrance. That's, that's really nice. He's got a, a phrase. So he did all the work that a company would like in regards to, Hey, we can trust this guy. And so in, in, in essence, the only note I have is Jay Uso is synonymous with what the intercontinental belt really means. The next guy up that's kind of getting an opportunity that you give the belt to that can wrestle, 
that you say, okay, right now you are firmly in that spot where, hey, you're you're somebody we should feature and give a belt to. So it's just really special. And and I just think that Jey Uso winning was perfect. Uh, it's not going to hurt Braun Breaker in any capacity. He don't need no belt. He's going to run through people. He's going to get back at Jey Uso in some capacity. I just think that uh, sometimes the Intercontinental belt or a title is used to also put someone on the map, and, and, and then they can say, okay, this is guy. This this guy is next. But uh, Jey Uso can be the the wrestler that keeps it for a year, like the Miz, and, and and really put that belt, continuing the legacy of the IC belt. So it was great to see everybody embraced it. The internet, it's always good when the wrestlers come out and say, hey, hey, they go online, they're like, hey, man, this is good shit to see. And it's just also a, a good sign to the locker room. Hey, put in your work, and you don't have to get your title within a year or two years. Hey, Triple H will do right by you if you bust your ass and understand that the guy that's running things understands the entire gamut of professional wrestling at the highest level. Remember, the guy running things used to put on a dumbass, uh, hierarchy-looking king shit and, and prance around the ring. He understands bad gimmicks. He understands all the aspects that are involved in taking a character from one level to another. And he, he don't have to take, you don't need to turn the heat on high ever, ever. He can go slow burn, get you involved, build the character, and he then knows the exact right time to pull something out of the oven and feed it to you. And that's why everybody loved it because it took so fucking long for Jey Uso to get recognized. But once we saw it, everybody loved it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was put very eloquently by you. It's one of those things where this guy has come in, he's earned the trust, he's done the work, and he's now in a position where he is your new Intercontinental Champ, and he is so over with the crowd, and it's fantastic to see. Uh, it was really awesome to watch him win that, and if you checked out anything online afterwards, uh, Kathy Kelly, I believe, did a couple of interviews with him. Um, they did a lot of stuff for for their website and for their uh for their social media platforms their their exclusive stuff and i thought it was so well done him in the crowd getting talked to uh, about what this means to him i thought it was absolutely fantastic I thought it was really, oh really oh, good. oh cause jay uso spoke in that kathy kelly interview i have to go back and watch jay uso's part <laughs> <laughs> my bad somebody's a, somebody's a fan of kathy kelly huh <laughs> and, and, and and her social media is on point she represents Herself and her brand very well. I, re- I she, highly recommend. She does it. a good job. Yes, great it, job. Her stuff with Rhea Ripley is always fantastic and fun. So I I, I do enjoy it. So uh, let's let's transition over to to Friday night real quick. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on on this because really and truly the entire episode centered around Kevin Owens and Randy Orton and kind of their relationship with Cody Rhodes. And there was a point where uh, Randy Orton was out in the ring, calls out Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes comes out. Then Kevin Owens comes out. And just as Kevin's getting ready to talk, the bloodline come out and kind of interrupt everything. And there was a point where Kevin Owens sets up a tag team match. And Cody's like, well, we don't need to just have a tag team. We can have a, a, a triple threat. And as he was saying that, Kevin Owens basically shut him down and was like, no, you got your match. You worry about your match. This is our match. We don't need you in our business. And kind of almost played that that hurt girlfriend, right? Like just really upset with, with the decision that Cody Rhodes made. And because of that, doesn't want any part of him. Then we have a, a segment backstage where, Kevin, obviously there's some issues we have to talk. And Kevin does a great job of playing that almost like upset frustrated, just pissed off dad, where he's like, we do need to talk. We don't need to talk right now. I'm busy. I'm in the middle of trying to prepare for a match tonight with Randy and just kind of fires up and just kind of shoots up, gets in his face. And it's like, at a certain point, it's like, I'm just going to go get my gear on. He's like, don't bother coming out to the ring tonight. If you do, you're just going to mess stuff up. And Randy's like, look, free to come out to the ring. If these guys come out, you do need some backup. I'll go talk to Kevin, this, that, the other thing. Cody Rhodes comes down interrupts the match. Kevin Owens ends up getting pinned. Kevin gets pissed and basically grabs Cody by the face and pushes his face and and shoves him away. And they get really kind of into each other. Randy kind of calms it down. In the end, you're left with the scene of Kevin Owens hugging Cody Rhodes as they kind of say, he's like, sorry, all right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like, all right, we're, we're good. We're good. We're good. My big takeaway from all of this, and I kind of want to know where you're at with this, is at some point, 
and it's probably going to go in this order. Kevin Owens and then Randy Orton will take out Cody Rhodes. I think the big swerve would be if it was Randy first and then Kevin, but I think these two guys, these two guys who are supposed to be Cody's friends, uh, Randy Orton's supposed to be the guy who Cody Rhodes looked up to and was the guy who helped mentor Cody Rhodes when he was young. Uh, Kevin Owens, the guy who always has uh, Cody Rhodes back. At some point, these two guys are going to cross Cody Rhodes and are going to take him out, and I feel like it is going to be sooner than later. I wanted to get your thoughts on that, and if you had the same feeling watching Friday Night SmackDown, and if you took that away. Oh, it was great, man, because you recognize great, great storytelling, and you have a logical reason why. Kevin's upset because, simply put, Cody Rhodes tagging with Roman Reigns is really confusing to Randy Orton, and that's what he said when he came right came out right away. He's like, I'm confused. I need to know because because of what the impact of what Roman did, there are consequences. The bloodline cost Kevin Owens championship opportunities. There's a visceral reason he's upset and hypersensitive, and then to see your friend now tagging with him and being friends with him, that's, that's something that is conflicting. So absolutely, I think it would be great to see um, Cody now have to face up for his actions, and it'll be great to see how they reveal it. And um, it's great because it's a slow build with Kevin as well, who's frustrated and he doesn't like losing. And the way they, they, they told it on SmackDown was perfect. And then I liked how Solo was was used. I thought that his timing was really good when he comes out and he's just like, uh, you know, Oklahoma City, be quiet. And the crowd yeah, literally was just it, it was instantly booing him. And then at the end, you know. The, you know, you got Solo peeking at the, you know, at the ring going, look at what's going out, these guys. And it just, it, it was a good way to use Solo to be the antagonist, to be like, look at these clowns. And mm-hmm. it was, it's good to see. And yeah, it's just new, fresh information, new, fresh angles. And there's already a built in reason why. And the history with Randy can be retold. And you have two perfect opponents for Cody in the future. Um, while, um, while Roman Reigns hits the, hits the Civil War. Yeah. And I think, Speaking of Solo, I thought it was good because he was kind of he was kind of the combustible element in in all of this, right? He kept pointing to to both Randy and Kevin and telling Cody like you can't beat us with those guys. They let you down all the time, almost like trying to drive a wedge. Like Kevin's already upset at Cody, and Randy's kind of on the fence right now. But now trying to get Cody to kind of turn on these two at the same time, I thought it was well done. And it was trying to to add a little bit of misdirection, add a little bit of disbelief in their friendship and how soon this could really, really explode. So I thought it was really, really well done. As far as WWE goes, was there anything else that caught your eye or that you really wanted to talk about this week? Because I thought it was a very good week from WWE. I thought they did a good job continuing a couple of stories that they've invested some time in. And I think the crowning of Jey Uso was fantastically done, but also mixing in uh, this little bit with Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens and making that combustible element feel like it's ready to go, like it's a tinderbox ready to ignite. I thought it was fantastically done. Yeah, no doubt. All across the board, it's, it's slotted very well. The mid-card with L.A. Knight is great. With Bronson Reed is special. The tag team scene is, is intriguing now uh, with the Street Profits and how things are shaping up for them. And, and and moving forward, so I'm uh, I'm very intrigued by everything going on in WWE. It's really good. It's a natural progression of a lot of storylines. And I thought the Nia Jax, uh, Chip Stratton segment was intriguing mm-hmm. as well. So a lot of good stuff from SmackDown. A lot of good stuff from Raw. WWE is firing on all cylinders, and it's great too because even NXT is benefiting from the crossover of having a lot of WWE talent show up there, and everybody is is picking up. And then now we have another feud with Carmelo Hayes and. Uh, Andrade El Idolo where <laughs> they, they, they're fighting repeatedly and it's always fun because we joked about the Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn feud and uh, now they're just fighting on a regular basis so it, it's great to see I just think that everybody's in their right spot at the moment and then the best part is they announced that Friday AJ Styles is coming back so the so next week Smackdown before Bad Blood is going to be sweet yeah it should be good it, I was wondering I was like man where is AJ Styles and there was a report that came out this week that He's just he's just doing the, the, the live show thing, and then he's sometimes not even at the tapings. He's just kind of spending time with his family, and then we get the announcement that next week. So look forward to seeing AJ Styles come back next week. You did bring up a name when you were talking, and it was Bronson Reed. And 
I think what they've done for the promotional feature for Bad Blood with Bronson Reed and Braun Strowman, I think it's absolutely fantastic. It has this Godzilla versus who's the other guy that Godzilla faces? It was Godzilla and um, what, King Kong. It, it kind of has that motif to it where you've got one guy kind of sludging through the water coming up, and you've got another guy breaking the city, and they're meeting, and they're, they look like these massive monsters in this little tiny like Lego town. It, it was, I think the way that they did it was absolutely fantastic, and it's it adds a lot to these guys looking like real monsters, these guys looking like bigger-than-life people who are just going to crush it. So I thought it was well done, and I just kind of wanted to highlight that as you brought that name up because that stuck out to me. Um, let's jump into AEW. There's a lot that took place with AEW this week. And I think kicking off AEW's Dynamite, you had Nigel McGuinness versus Brian Danielson. I wanted to get your thoughts on this match because – as I watched this match, I was heavily distracted. Um, this was a match that I was really looking forward to. If you were a fan of ROH back in the day, uh, these guys really put it on the map. Uh, these guys really helped elevate Ring of Honor wrestling. These two guys were, were pioneers, and you knew at some point they were going to get that WWE run. Now, Brian Danielson obviously got it, got taken away, and then he got it back, and he became one of the biggest things in wrestling. Nigel McGuinness never really got the fair shake at it. When he ended up getting to to WWE, they had him in NXT, and then he ended up having uh, a head and neck injury. So he never really got the run that he was supposed to get. He obviously now cleared, able to wrestle in AEW. And this was a match that I was pumped up for. This was circled on my on my calendar, and I just don't think – the execution was done appropriately for a couple of different reasons. But I wanted to get your thoughts, and then I'll kind of uh, I- expand on why I thought that they kind of dropped the ball with this match. What did you make of this match? Because I'm wondering if I'm being too hard and too critical. No, it just it, sometimes chemistry doesn't work out in terms of a match. Sometimes maybe it needs better production. The why needs to be told better. The psychology in the ring needs to be told. Uh, sometimes the crowd also doesn't, you know – maybe even understand. I just think that the match needed another maybe week or two of build. Mm-hmm. I just think that you need to tell the story. Uh, Nigel can share a little bit of why this match is so meaningful to him. I just think one vignette, a couple more reasons. Again, this is just Tony Khan throwing a match together, and he, he expects the marks to know it. Yeah, they're going to know it, but if you want to appeal to a broader audience, I think you can also – and see, that's what WWE does. Like, we already know why Kevin Owens is going to fight Cody Rhodes. We know – why Randy Orton is going to fight Cody Rhodes because, you know, they need opponents and they need things, but there's a, a natural reason. So it would basically be like, all right, everybody, next week it's Cody Rhodes versus Kevin Owens. And you're just like, uh, wait a minute, like Kevin didn't explode yet. You, you know what I mean? So I just think that, you know, you could have even played up the Nigel McGuinness part where he's battling himself as confidence or he's battling like, man, I, I, I'm excited to do this, but I'm scared because I might, not, I might like a little bit of intrigue around the match and then the match itself it just yeah it, it didn't deliver to the to the degree of the anticipation and that's a, never a good sign is that the hype is so built like we want to see this match but it didn't end up i think coming across on television as as being executed the way fans would like yeah so a, a couple of the things that i had trouble with right and you touched on some of them i feel like the build incredibly rushed uh they wanted to do this whole thing where Brian Danielson might not be able to make the match where he might not be able to come out. Well, they played his music and it was his red dragon music. And then they scrapped that. And then they played final countdown and he walked right out. Like, I feel like this match specifically should have just been put at the back end of the show. And you would have had an hour and a half run up to build to this moment. Like we haven't seen him all day. We're not sure if he's going to be cleared. You could have had people doing backstage segments where they're like, yeah, the doctors are, are have to check about, he's got to get cleared. He's not even in the building, so he can't even get cleared yet. And you can do some stuff with Nigel McGuinness where he's like, well, just shows you that he's a coward and that he's not going to show up. He can't even show up to get checked out for the match. You, you could have did more. This was an incredibly rushed build. And this is a, a dream match that everybody has because we remember it being so good years ago. And I just feel like they dropped the ball with the rush build on the front end. And then on the back end, the day of the show, 
you put this as number one on your card and you don't utilize your runtime, the hour and a half that you have before this match even needs to take place to add a little bit of doubt and, and to really kind of flesh out this story. I just feel like you dropped the ball and you botched it. And then, and look, some people are going to probably be mad about this, but I don't care. I don't need to hear Jim Ross on commentary ever again. Mm. Jim Ross on commentary is horrible at this point. Jim Ross on commentary, he's not the same guy that he was when you and I were growing up. It's not the Attitude Era anymore. Jim Ross is a relic. He is a fossil. Yes, I know he's got a ton of knowledge. Stick to your stick to your podcast. Stick to slinging your barbecue sauce. I don't need to hear you anymore on television. You suck. You are absolutely horrible. AEW's commentary team is absolute trash. What you need to do is you need to pare it down. You only need two guys. You got two guys who are great on that desk, and that is Excalibur and that is Taz. And those are the only two guys you really need. Tony Schiavone is a giant disruption and a giant distraction and adds nothing to the match. JR just kind of mumbles, and they have to constantly keep redirecting him with what's going on. He can't keep up. He doesn't even understand what's going on. I'm not sure he knows what year it is or what month it is, <laughs> much less the day. He is honestly like Alzheimer's setting in. The dude needs to just go someplace. And this is going to sound harsh. Go someplace, live out your retirement, just just go die. It's okay. You had a really good run, man. You were fantastic. Please stop fucking up my wrestling show. I don't need to hear you anymore. I'm just I'm over you. You are done. You were great when I was a kid. You will be the you will be the audio soundtrack for wrestling when I was a child. And that is fantastic, and I love you for it. But now as an adult and as a man and me having a child of my own, we don't need to hear you. Just go someplace. It's over. Your run is done. Whatever you do at AEW, just keep doing it. Do your podcast. Sling your barbecue sauce. Do what you got to do. I don't need you on TV. He ruined that match for me. The, mm. the build for this match and and the way that they placed it on the card and not utilizing time appropriately – and then he himself ruined this match for me, and I was I was just I was frustrated with it because this was something like I said I circled I look forward to, and I was willing to give it a shot. And Tony Khan takes another shit on my chest. I was pissed. I was frustrated. That's all I got to say. I'm a little bit harsh. I'm sorry. Um, I don't. There's no easy transition. But I look. I think AEW did something good here. Hook beats Roddy Strong, and then he retires the FTW belt. Uh, I want to know if you thought this was the right move because I love this. I felt like this belt was was silly. I thought this belt back when we were kids in ECW had a place. I felt like this belt in AEW just added another belt. And what they need to do is they need to start pairing belts down. They have way too many belts, way too many champions. It gets very convoluted. This was a belt that was never really recognized by AEW, but they did recognize it. It was weird. It was in this weird little limbo. Um, you knew that Hook wasn't really going to ever lose this. Yeah, I know Chris Jericho had it for a couple of days, and then Hook took it off of him, but that was a stupid story. It didn't do really a whole lot for Hook. Um, I, I think this was the right move, and I think retiring the belt, I thought it was a cool moment between Hook and Taz. I thought that was really nice. I thought this is the best thing you could have did. I even said before this match, I was like, they need to get rid of this belt. They need to retire it at some point. And they went ahead and they did it. It was like they were listening to me. Thank you, AEW, for retiring this belt. Did you like them moving on from this championship belt and putting it off to the side and us not using it anymore? Yeah, no doubt about it. Perfect setting, New York, origin. And I just think that it's interesting that you brought up JR, too, because um, with me lately, I just think that I have wrestling on. I'm focused on it, but I kind of tuned down a little bit because you got, I got kids and stuff going on. So I kind of watch wrestling with a little bit less of an emphasis on the announcers. Ever since that Scottish European dude kind of came into Raw, I just don't care about the announcers. I like McAfee and stuff like that, but after one week, you know his antics are just to hype up the crowd. Mm -hmm. I just think that you're, we are not in the best era of announcers. I like Joe Tessitore. I like his voice. It's, it's a, a voice that is meant to cover sports. But it's just to me, I'm more into in regards to ranking. I'm into the story, into the why, into the match. And, yeah, I think Michael Cole is somebody that you always want to listen to. But I just think that the in-ring call of a match, it's I hear it. But I don't, I don't like, it, it's kind of like synonymous. Like we're, it's like so subliminal where you just hear voices. But I'm just into the moves. I'm into the well, how this match is going to play out. I'm into who wins and why and then the after effect. 
So to me, I just rank the the call of the match very low because yeah, WWE cycled so many. They even had you know a guy come in that lasted like six months, and the crowd was like, "Please get this guy off the air. Yeah, he he sucks." And so they rotated they they rotated so much because they're trying to find that historical link. And uh, I think the new guys are doing okay. But yeah, I don't. I, I I do like Corey Graves. I think he's up there. AEW, you're absolutely right. They do got to pare it down. And I I just think that the crowd in New York was really great. So I was intrigued by the the match and things like that. I don't really care about the announcers all that much. So I love the match. I like what they're doing with Hook. I just think that it's time to take him to the next level and, and quickly. Yeah, and I think getting rid of that belt really frees him up now. And that was probably the most important thing about retiring that belt is you move him away from that championship so he doesn't have to be the one defending it all the time. And now you can put him in a real story. You can really help elevate him. Uh, speaking of elevation, MVP is all elite. He showed up. Uh, what did you think of his segment? Kind of trying to sweel, steal Swerve from Prince Nana, basically saying that, the reason that Swerve's kind of on this bit of a losing streak is because of his representation in Prince Nana, who was out there slanging his coffee and dancing. And MVP really highlighted this. What did you make of, of MVP's debut in, in All Elite Wrestling? I loved it, but it could have been better. I mean, you don't know, like, I got it. The crowd reacted a little bit late, but all you had to do was give the poor guy some music. All you had to do was. You know, Swerve is talking. All of a sudden, there's an interruption. There's a big, huge screen behind you. All you got to do is turn it black, MVP, hurt, and then you play some music. Some, so we are in the business of hurting, and, and that's all you got to do is just have uh, MVP have four, just that line. We are in the business of hurting, and then you play MVP on the screen. He comes out. I just thought the moment production-wise would have been better. Instead, he just walks out there. And it's like we all knew MVP's coming, but you could have made the moment grander. Everything mm-hmm. has to be grander. Like sometimes you do – look, Vince McMahon was crazy, but there was a genius in there. And the, I just think that there's got to be somebody in Tony Khan's ear that's just got to be yelling, grander, bigger, bolder, grander, bigger, bigger, more. Like just MVP walking out there is like, okay, he's out there. And I just thought it could have been done better. But, yeah, I'm curious because all the sleuths are out there. They were like, ooh, uh, the card that he gave Prince Nana said Hurt Syndicate. So that also could mean other guys coming. Uh, um, you saw Hobbs backstage. You saw potentially uh, Bobby Lashley could be part of this when he kind of transitions now to the next part of his career. So to me, good. It's great to see him. I think it's going to be fun. Um, MVP is a unique individual, and the history can be told now in AEW, but it should have been grander his entrance and into a new company. Yeah. I didn't really like, look, I was excited to see him. I didn't really like the way he was, right. He was showing, right. Like you said, it, it could have been bigger, could have been better. This could have been, or this should have been a really big moment. And it just right. kind of felt like it was there. It was just filling time. Um, I think you brought up a name that would fit perfectly with this. And that is powerhouse Hobbs. Powerhouse Hobbs is supposed to be healthy now, supposed to be on his way back to wrestling. Uh, ended up hurting his knee in a match against John Moxley a while ago. Sounds like he's good to go. Look, the the important thing that came out of this segment specifically is, you know Bobby Lashley's coming, and we believe that Shelton Benjamin is coming as well. So if those two guys are going to come and hang out, and they're going to set up the Hurt Syndicate, which is what we what we've speculated on, uh, you can add Powerhouse Hobbs to that, and that helps get Powerhouse Hobbs a little bit of a rub and helps get him over. I like that. I think you like that as well. And then what you can do is now you've set up Bobby Lashley and Swerve. When he returns, you set up basically a match between these two guys, and I think that could be really interesting. I think you now know that when Swerve comes back or when Bobby Lashley comes in, their first true test is going to be each other. And that could be that could be really nice. I just feel like the way we got there, a little clunky, a little weird, not necessarily great. And that was kind of what I thought about our our main event. I thought the way we got here, a little clunky, a little weird. Uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of where we go from here. But John Moxley ends up defeating Darby Allen, and he's now going to face Brian Danielson. Again, I thought the way this was done, the way this was executed over the course of, of basically two weeks was not ideal. Didn't really allow it to build. 
didn't do a fantastic job with it. And the way we got there was, was kind of silly. I do think John Moxley versus Brian Danielson could be a really interesting match. Uh, Brian Danielson at the end of this match came out and started choking John Moxley with a tie. Uh, I, I want to know what your excitement level is for John Moxley and Brian Danielson meeting, uh, at the upcoming pay per view and, and where, where you think this kind of ranks in kind of AEW lore as far as some of their top matches? Because I think this has the possibility to be a great match. Both these guys can go. Both these guys have very different wrestling styles, and we both know styles make matches. So yes. it could be great, and they have chemistry together. They have history together. Uh, I just feel like they really did a bad job of getting us to this match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's it's – it's something that I think this is one of those things where the two performers, the match itself can overcome a bad build. Look, you got two guys that are from the big company up north. Everybody knows what they're about. They can wrestle. They can tell stories in the ring. So they can, this is one of those ones you don't need a lot. You don't just like, okay, one was a betrayal. One was, you know, now trying to prove himself. I think both of them can do, you know, some great work this upcoming week in terms of hyping the fight. But this is one of those ones where go in the ring destroy each other and tell the ring tell the story in the ring psychologically they will do that and so it's must watch no matter what so i'm, I'm excited to see it and I, I just think that is a great scenario in which um john moxley can continue to help uh brian danielson in his run because i think danielson should go over i think danielson should be the one that continues to showcase why he's the he's world champion quality and i think that moxley man just him in the main event is going to be great and him losing might set him off where maybe he's got to turn to higher powers to get what he wants. Yeah, look, I think these guys, like you said, they can take a little and they'll give you a lot. Uh, I, I think this match will be good. Again, I just feel like dream matches like this don't necessarily come around all that often. And for right. a guy like Brian Danielson, he's like this is the final quarter mile of his career. He doesn't have a lot left. He's already said that. His neck injury is pretty severe. They've already accounted that he's going to have to have surgery when he retires, and he will be done at that point. So this is his farewell tour. You need to do these things better because you don't get to do these things again. And any bad bump that he might take, legit, might be the last bump that he takes. Mm -hmm. So when you have opportunities to do matches like these, and that's the one thing I thought that they were going to do with him, I thought that they were going to just get this stuff right and just – they haven't been able to do it. And I hate being this critical of this company because this company has given us so much good stuff, but they just don't get it right. And it is frustrating. There are things that they absolutely knock out of the park. And there are things like this where they kind of uh, bunt a single up the first baseline. And you're like, well, maybe you'll get there safely. We'll see. Um, overall, I-, I thought what we got from, from Arthur Ashe Stadium, I thought it was good. Uh, I thought the matches were good. I don't think the storytelling was good. And it just kind of seems to be something that we're getting more regularly with AEW. You're getting really good matches. You're getting really good in-ring work. But you're just not getting the stories that we're looking for. And that, to me, is frustrating because I think the reason that you and I watch wrestling are for really good stories. And the action is part of that really good story. Uh, They're getting one part of it right the majority of the time that's that in-ring work but the storyline that kind of feeds into that in-ring work has just been lacking and it is frustrating to me so um but look I'll, I'll tell you this much right my my wife yells at me when we watch aew and she makes fun of me she used to be huge with aew um she doesn't really care anymore because the storyline's not there uh when we watch aew there's a lot of times where i'm sitting on my phone and i'm mindlessly scrolling or I'm looking at other things or I'm working on other things and it is on and I'm just kind of got one eye on it, one ear on it. And she's like, are you even paying attention? She's like, how do you pay attention to this? She's like, it's just background noise for you. And I'm like, no, I'm watching. I was like, that was a really good move right there. And what just took place there was really good. And I'm like, I'm like watching, but it is like just kind of very That's surface cool. watching. Yeah. It, it's just like, it's just there. And it's because there's nothing there that really hooks me or draws me in for any other storylines that they have. And when you and I dedicate as much time as we dedicate to this specific podcast, because we have to watch so much wrestling, it sucks, man, because we are we are taking a lot of time out of our days. And me and you are both very busy people to watch this stuff. 
You know, I mean, that's like two hours I could free up to do just about anything else in my life. You know what I'm saying? So it is what it is. But what what was your show of the week? I'm, I'm going to stop bashing at UW here. What was your show of the week? <laughs> I thought SmackDown was great, succinct. I thought the stars really told their stories, and you got intrigued with what's going on with Kevin Owens and Cody Rhodes. And I just thought that you open a show with Randy Orton, that's pretty sweet. The crowd was excited, and then you followed that up with an entrance by Cody Rhodes. I thought that was pretty sweet. Um, man, it was a good show. I thought SmackDown – hit on all the notes in the two-hour show. Yeah, I thought SmackDown was great, too. And look, you want to talk about a product that's not stale, a product that's going to tell you storylines and going to give you good stuff in the ring. It was SmackDown this week. You got two hours of it. Uh, if you got time, go check it out. If you want to speed through the commercials, about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 35 minutes. I thought it was really well done. Uh, you want some news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What the heck made your list? So we talked about that documentary earlier. Vince McMahon has responded to the new Netflix documentary. After over four years of production, Netflix released that six-part series titled Mr. McMahon this past Wednesday. On Monday night before the release date, former WWE chairman and CEO Vince McMahon issued a statement regarding the Netflix dossier about him. Addressing the series, McMahon posted the following statement on social media. I don't regret participating in the Netflix documentary. The producers had the opportunity to tell an objective story about my life and the incredible business I built, which were equally filled with excitement, drama, fun, and a fair amount of controversy and life lessons. Unfortunately, based on an early partial cut I've seen, this doc falls short and takes the predictable path of conflating the Mr. McMahon character with my true self, Vince. The title and promos alone make that evident. A lot has been misrepresentative or left out entirely in an effort to leave viewers intentionally confused. The producers are producers use typical editing tricks without uh, without of context footage and dated sound bites to distort the viewers' perception and support a deceptive narrative. In an attempt to further their misleading account, the producers use a lawsuit based on an affair I ended as evidence that I am in fact Mr. McMahon. I hope the viewers will keep an open mind and remember that there are two sides to every story. Uh, very interesting with him coming out with that beforehand. Um, look, again, I haven't seen it. You've seen it. He seems to contradict himself quite a bit. And there are times where he basically says he is Mr. McMahon or the reason he was able to portray the Mr. McMahon character is because it is in some parts him. And then he releases this statement where he says that he's not Mr. McMahon. So, one of those things, I do recommend you go check out the documentary. Sounds like it's very, very good. Uh, a new Bloodline member in NXT, Mike Johnson of PW Insider, is reporting that Hikaleo has been added to the WWE NXT internal roster, meaning that he is expected to spend at least some time on the developmental brand. Hikaleo, the son of Haku, uh, being real-life brothers with Tamatanga and being considered the adopted brother of Tagaloa, has been heavily speculated that Haku will jo- or Hikaleo will join his brothers in the Bloodline faction. Um, I think after what you've seen from uh, Tamatanga and Tangaloa, this is probably the best. You remember, Tangaloa has had multiple botches since coming to the main roster. Tamatanga has been much better, but Tangaloa has had some really bad spots. So this is probably just a way to kind of work off any rust and a way to kind of get him used to the WWE uh, way of doing things. Uh, AEW pay-per-views may have a new home soon. According to Andrew Zarian of the Matt Men podcast, AEW and Max, the streaming service, may have a deal in place where AEW's pay-per-view will be streamed on the streaming service starting in January. Zarian did say that there's a possibility for the pay-per-views to stream sooner than the January 2025 date. The belief is this is all part of the new Warner Brothers discovery deal that's going to be announced soon so we'll have to wait and see on that and this aew wrestler sticking around but for how long in a new update fightful select reports that soraya is set to stay in aew for at least another year she has reportedly re-signed with the promotion on a one-year agreement that runs until september of 2025 there was said to be an option year that aew could have picked up at the end of her last contract but sources implied her new one-year deal could actually be separate, a separate new agreement rather than just the activation of that one-year option. So a little bit of uh, fuzziness there. It's not really clear whether or not this is the one-year option or if she 
was able to to renegotiate and extend her deal. Um, we'll have to wait and see. It's weird because Soraya was somebody who was brought in. There was supposed to be all this pomp and circumstance, and there was supposed to be this big build, and she has just kind of fizzled in her time in AEW. She almost seems direct, directionless right now. So we'll see what takes place with Soraya going forward. But that's going to do it for this week's news and notes, my brother. Man, good recap. Always good information in the world of professional wrestling. My goodness, so much going on in AEW, WWE, TNA's got Bound for Glory upcoming. So much good stuff going on. NXT now transitioning to the CW. My goodness, so much in the world of wrestling that it's just amazing to keep up with. Sometimes it's a chore, but you do think that with new TV deals, sometimes some people are distracted. Those millions exchanging hands takes up time, and it's just natural. And I do think that, naturally speaking, Tony Khan is distracted. He owns a, an NFL team. He owns a soccer club. He's traveling the world. So can he drink that much coffee to be able to write creatively and build everything? He's probably like, oh, I'm going to take this off and just, uh, okay, I want this match. All right, good. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> so let's see if the masses will convince him to tell some stories. It's starting to get there. It's getting there ever so slowly. And this kind of harkens back to our memory if you listen to our podcast circa 2020, 2019, when we would bitch and complain about Raw, and they finally decided to tell stories, and people were invested at a much higher level. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSGROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Hit us up. If you like or dislike any of our opinions, let us know. We definitely are open to debate, talk and wrestling as the world of professional sports is always interwoven with professional wrestling. It's great to see. And I'm loving the fact that, you know, WWE is, is going global and more and more people want to be involved with it. And as the, the company continues to grow and AEW is still trying to figure things out, it's going to be fun to, to, to monitor and to always break it down week by week on the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.